Word of the Lord. Yes. Amen. Brother Sims, you're always going to be your God. We love you and your ministry. And uh, Sister Crystal, which is my first cousin, Dwayne married my first cousin. And uh, she taught me about Nicodemus in her first time to teach Sunday school at Woden, I think. And so I still remember that. Yeah. So you never know. You never know. You, you teach something to a kid and you're like, oh, they'll forget it. I remember that and I'm 33 now. She probably taught me that when I was like 12. And so you're not going to find a better family. Amen. And I truly mean that. And I feel like we're in the perfect will of God. I was talking to him several weeks ago. And I said, hey, do you want to come the end of this month? He said, yes, sir. And this is capping off. Amen. I believe one of the most uh, amazing. Me personally, I, I've seen the demonstration of God move here in the last month. I'm telling you, God is doing something. You see the effects of it right now. I've had people call me and say, Brother Rankin, just pray for me. I'm telling you, God is stirring and God is moving. And we're, we may not see it, but we can see the effects of it. Amen. Everybody say, Brother Sims. Brother Sims. You're at home. Preach to us. Amen. Let's give the Lord a good hand clap of praise as he comes to take the remainder of the service. Praise the Lord. Let's give that to the Lord right now. Amen. Jesus, we love you. You're so good. Come on, just for a few moments. We're going to magnify the Lord. Hallelujah. Nobody like you, Jesus. You're great. Great to be praised. Your greatness is unsearchable. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Give somebody a high five and you can be seated. Amen. All right. Everybody's on board. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Elder. <laughs> so good to be back here in Victoria. Feel the presence of the Lord. You all look good. In the house of the Lord, I also extend a warm welcome to all of our visitors and all the home folks. Hey, you're what makes it what it is. Amen. Whether it's your first time or you've been coming for years, you're the difference maker in the presence of the Lord. So we're so glad that all of our visitors are here. We extend honor this morning to Bishop and Sister Kite. What wonderful people God has blessed you with. I don't get to say that often because I'm not here often. But when I am here, I want to be sure to give these people honor. What wonderful Christians that God has put in your How about a hand clap of appreciation to the Lord for the Bishop and Sister Clark. We love you, Lord. God bless you. And to Brother and Sister Rankin, my Lord. Rankins have been a part of our life for a long, long time. And unless they kick me out, it's going to continue to be that way. But uh, we, we honor Elder Brother and Sister Rankin, Barry and Paul up there. Brandon and Shan have done amazing things. We're extremely proud of them. Uh, my wife and I get to talk about uh, all of the things that we've got to experience. Just because it's bad doesn't make it bad. It becomes an experience, right? And if it's good, it's an experience. And God uses everything to make us better for the kingdom. But we're so proud of what Pastor and Sister Rankin are doing here. I appreciate Brandon's, if you'll allow me to say that, Brandon's spirit. Uh, we lived on the church property there for a number of years, and we would see his lights, his headlights, as he would go to pray. I don't know what the deal was. I don't know why he couldn't pray normal hours of the day. But he would be there all hours of the morning, evening, at night. You'd see either he or his dad that the lights would shine through the house, and he would be there praying. And I seen God do amazing things in his life, and I seen consecration where he set himself apart unto the Lord. And we are blessed to have those types of leaders in our life. So I give honor to Pastor and Sister Rankin this morning for vision and for setting themselves apart unto the Lord. Adeline has not made her mind up about me yet. Elizabeth has. She let me talk to her last night. I think I spoke her language. But uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. But we love this wonderful family. So I'm going to read some scriptures to you. Uh, I know you would normally stand for the reading of the Word of God. I don't want to mess up anybody's thinking, but I may stop a few times. And I know you've been standing, so I'm just going to let you remain seated. Is that all right, Pastor? It's all right. We're going to Acts, go to Acts 27 and verse 40. Uh, very excited to have my family, my wife, of course, and uh, my daughter get to travel with me. They don't have an option. They always have to go. Uh, but my boys, Jaron and Gavin, don't always get to go. They're, I guess they call themselves young adults. So I'm not sure. Gavin's a tightwad with that money too, Bishop. I probably won't see a dime of that anyway. 
I said, Gavin, how much money have you made this summer? He said, about $1,800. I said, how much do you have in your savings? He said, about $1,800. <laughs> I said, he says he's mine. I agree. So, anyway, so glad to have them, my wife, daughter, my boys, and then Ricardo Medina. He is a minister in training, whether he wants to believe that or not, but I love Ricardo very much. Great young man from the church in Coppers Cove, Texas. Comes from a great family. Ricardo, thank you for making the trip, making sure that I still preach the truth. So we love those guys. So Acts 27 and 40, if you got a sack out. All right, the right side over here said they have it. You left side people are in trouble. That's not a political statement. My Lord, let's go ahead and clear the air with that. Five minutes in and it's political. No, 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 no. All right. We get, politics is good then. Okay. 27 and 40. And when they had taken up the anchors, they committed themselves to the sea. So as we're going through this, whether I get to preach this whole message or not, who knows, because I feel the Holy Ghost. But sometimes you've got to commit yourself to it regardless of how it feels. All right? If God is setting direction in your life, it's better to not fight it. Okay? So you may not be able to figure. Here's the thing about us. Me, and I'm an average person, so this is how I am. We want to know how everything's going to be before we'll fully commit. And I, unfortunately, that's just not how God and faith works. God wants to know if we'll commit to Him because He already knows. Not because we know. Oh boy, that's going to be fun. Alright. So they took up the anchors. They committed themselves to the sea. They loosed the rudder bands. They're not going to fight direction anymore. That makes sense? Oh boy. They had that thing set on a course. And all of these external influences come in. And they had to commit themselves to the direction that God was going to take them. They hoisted up the mainsail to the wind and they moved toward shore. And falling into a place where two seas met, they got hung in the middle. They ran the ship aground and the forepart struck fast, stuck fast and remained unmovable. But the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves. One part was stuck, the other part was broken. And the soldiers' counsel was to kill the prisoners. They were going to die anyway, as far as they knew. They were going to make sure they killed them just in case. They were going to kill all the prisoners, lest any of them should swim out and escape. But the centurion, willing to save Paul, kept them for their purpose and commanded that they which could swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land. And the rest, some were on boards, some were on broken pieces of the ship. So it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land. So real quickly, Acts 28, so what, just flipping over one chapter there, Acts 28, 1 through 9. And when they were escaped, then they knew that the island was called Melita, the barbarous people, showed us no little kindness. So already the perception was we're going to have trouble. And then Paul said, but they were very kind. So it's not always how we perceive it when God has a plan. Right. All right? Now, we don't, we don't throw away wisdom. We don't. Throw away our ability to be reasonable thinkers. But when we're following the plan of God, we don't know how it's going to end. And I'm just going to keep on driving that home. Because if it's up to us, we'll just look at it and say it can't happen. And God will look at it and say, neither could you till I moved into your life. But none of us, none of us had this thing figured out and we weren't the shiniest and the best when God called us. But grace is sufficient. Oh, hear me. Grace is sufficient. There's barbarous people. There's people that were surely going to kill them. They showed us no little kindness. They kindled us a fire. They received us, everyone, because of the present rain and because of the cold. This was not what we were expecting. But God has a plan. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. Oh, Lord. And Paul gathered up a bundle of sticks. He laid them on the fire. There came a viper out of the heat, fastened, fastened on his hand. The ship got busted up because it got hung in between these opposing forces. They rode in on boards and broken parts of the ship. Now they're in all of these bad, with all these bad people. You know the story. And then Paul's going to light a fire. He's going to add to the fire. And he gets bit on the hand by a snake. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, no doubt this man is a murderer. So not only are we judging them, 
They're judging us. <laughs> we better be careful that we got the love of God in us. Because if our judgment doesn't work, theirs might. And we may never get them to a place where God can do for them what He's done for us. And don't forget that God's plan isn't finished yet. It's just not done. They see the venomous beast hang on his hand. They said, oh, he's a murderer. And he escaped the sea, but vengeance suffereth not to live. He's, he, he's bad. And he shook off the beast of the fire and felt no harm. Howbeit, they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly. But after they looked a great while, they checked him out. They saw no harm come to him. They changed their minds. They changed their minds. And then they said that he was a god. That was the only way that they could relate the miracle was to a god. Come on. That was the only way they could say this is working. This god. Something more powerful than a man or a woman had to move into that place and do that. During the same quarters were possessions of the chief man of the island, whose name was Publius, who received us and lodged us three days courteously. Again, these terrible people were so courteous. And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of fever and dysentery to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. He had a fever and Paul put his hands on him. There is a miracle. Right. Right. Yeah. Oh God, if I touch him, I'll end up being like him. He prayed for him. And when this was done, others also which had diseases in the island came and were healed. This thought, just for a little while. Ships, snakes, and revival. Ships, snakes, and revival. So I look at your neighbor and say, God's going to do something for you here today. Hallelujah. Daniel 7 and 25 is a prophetic scripture. It says this, He shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. He'll think to change the times and the laws and they shall be given unto his hand, in his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. So this is prophetic. Somewhere in Daniel's 70 weeks, somewhere Daniel teaching and preaching about tribulation, wherever this falls at in that particular text and that particular time, I think we can all agree that those things are happening right now in 2022, where we are changing time and changing laws. The moral and cultural norms are being twisted and the church is in the crosshairs. We are the one absolute thing left in this world that is being targeted. Now, the enemy cannot defeat the church. It can't happen. The Lord declared that in Matthew, that the gates of hell shall never prevail against the church. So there's going to be a church when the Lord comes back to rapture the church. Whenever he takes us out of here, there's going to be a church to take out of here. So we can rest assured in that fact that there's always going to be a church. We can't be defeated, but we can be wearied. Hear me. We can be wearied. So in the face of for sure victory, we can certainly become tired living this life and dealing with the continual onslaught and the continual fighting that's going on around us. Paul told Timothy this in 2 Timothy 4. The time will come when they won't endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. So they're going to allow people to speak the words that they want to hear, and they're not going to entertain anybody else's narrative. Does that sound familiar in 2022? We can no longer just simply disagree. Now we have to completely remove the right to have an opposing argument because if it ain't what some people want to hear, we're not going to hear anything. We shouldn't be surprised at the climate. Listen, I don't know how easy or how hard the last days are going to be. The Bible tells us to be prepared for destruction and for all manner of things. I don't know personally what it's going to be like, but friend, I don't feel like that it's going to be the easiest thing that the church has ever encountered. And the church has always encountered persecution. But what I do know is that regardless what comes or goes, there are So there'll be a twisting and a turning, changing times and changing 
laws, the moral and cultural boundaries will be extended beyond recognition. And Paul tells Timothy, they're not going to endure sound doctrine. They're going to, after their own lusts, go for the ones that tell them what they want to hear. They'll turn away their ears from the truth, and they'll be turned unto fables. It'll happen. Right. I, I, I don't want to have my head in the sand, and I don't want to ignore the fact that the church has put in that hour to be the difference. Come on. Right. I like it easy. Look at your neighbor and say, man, I wish it wasn't so hard. Right. I, I, I like it easy. But unfortunately, we have miraculous power in us, not because what we're facing is easy, but because what we are facing is going to take a miracle from the hand of God to make a difference. And it just so happens that we have that power in us. We got it. She so said they turn away their ears. They're not going to hear truth. They're turned to fables. Verse 5. 2 Timothy 4 5. He said, but you watch. I mean, stay sober. You watch. Watch in all things. Don't let anything escape the vision that God gives you through His Word and His promises. Watch in all things. Endure afflictions. It doesn't matter what comes and goes. We have the power and the authority to endure all of those things that don't In your affliction, do the work of an evangelist. He said, be a preacher. It means to declare, to bring, to show people the gospel. He said, make full proof of your ministry, meaning to carry it out completely until everything that God has called you to do has been accomplished. He said, you tell them when they don't want to hear it. You show them when they're looking for other things. He was saying, be sober. Don't lose your vision because there's going to be things around you that don't make sense. That comes in conflict and confusion. But in the middle of that is a church that can be sober. They're looking at him. Watching all things. Endure all afflictions and continue to do the work of the evangelist. Can I challenge us just as a side note? Friend, don't forget that what he put in us was not just for us. It's for everyone. Friend, don't forget what pit he brought me and you out of. What lifestyle he brought you and me out of. It ain't just for us. It's so I can love everybody. Watching all things. When it gets tough, keep looking at it. Endure affliction. Do the work of the evangelist. Take it all the way to completion. Friend, I'm in 100% agreement. It'd be easier just to quit and walk away. But unfortunately, that's not the calling of the church. Somebody is going to hear and say, well done. Somebody. We were in Cleveland yesterday driving down. As soon as I get out of my, my van. I see a guy at the other pump. I'm like, oh, you got me. That's the first thing I said. I said, oh, you got me. That's typical, right? That's great church people. Sometimes there's another guy over there. I don't know if I really want to talk to him. He said, hey, I'm out of gas. I don't know if he's telling the truth or not. No idea. He said, I'm out of gas. I'm trying to get somewhere. You ever even told me where he's trying to get can you help me at all? I thought, man, I don't have any cash. Yes. <laughs> this is all my inner dialogue, right? I don't have any cash. If I got a card, I'm about to pay for my gas with a card. I said, hey, man, I'll put some gas in your car. I said, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So, uh, he's probably lying. My first impulse was to think he was lying. And he had a stereotype. I didn't judge him. But I thought, ah, oh, he's lying to me. So I go over and put gas in his car. He's practically in tears. He said, hey, I'm an addict. I said, oh, okay. Well, what are, you, what are you on? What are you addicted to? He said, meth. I said, what's your name? So he picked us out, right? Uh -huh. My wife and I. I see my wife said, oh. Yeah. Yeah. They, they look at us, too. Yeah. Yeah. As the church. Us as in the church. 
Right? Is that, is that, is that doing okay? And they're not looking at us going, ah. Maybe they're going, can they do anything for me? Can they help me? How often does a church pull the sims and go, ah, I don't have any cash? I don't know if he was lying to me or not, but I wasn't lying to him when I said Jesus is still the way. What I'm trying to tell us is it does not matter what their message is because our message has not changed. Watch it all things and do every affliction. Do the work of an evangelist. Make the ministry living proof of a God that loves us. Make full proof of our ministry. Friend, we have forgotten what ministry means if we can't break down our card at the fuel pump and say, I Understand what that statement means. I don't care about porn addictions. I don't care about heathen and lying. It's all the impulse that surrounds the church. But in the middle of all of that conflict is the church that still works. And where are the men and the women that say, hey, I may be polished now. I may have an answer now. I may have a savings account now. But there was a He said, hey church, keep looking. Hey church, keep working. You don't matter how bad it hurts. Be the answer. So I don't know where Sean's at this morning. I don't know if he lied to me. I don't know if he went right back to his house and started doing the same thing he was doing before he told me his story. But friend, what I told him was the absolute living proof that God loves everybody. I told him the truth. You can be seated. Stay sober. Don't let things get in to your mind. Stay with it. Stay with it. Stay with it. Paul, Paul told the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians 11 and 1, you follow me because I'm following him. Amen. That's why. He was saying, hey, you may see me doing things differently, but it's only because I'm following yeah. him. Right. Yeah. For don't ever, don't ever let us get confused that we're so good and so great that they can pattern every, pattern everything after what you and I do or do not do. I understand there's a lifestyle that comes with consecration unto God. But unless we're following Him, there's no power in that. I can live by good habits every day of my life. But I don't have the power to deliver you because of my good habits. But if I can tell you there was a time when I was broken. And I'm going to take you to the one that fixed everything. Then we have the enablement and the power of the Holy Ghost to say if you're going to follow, follow because Follow him. Follow me because I follow. The surroundings aren't going to be perfect. Neither will the people. Ministry is just servanthood. Love people like they are until they become like him. This thing is a process. We're all still in the middle of it. But I'm going to love them. Every Sean, every meth addict, every adulterer and fornicator, every liar and thief, every manipulator and person consumed with anger. I'm going to love them like they are until they become like him. I'm going to be God's heart and hands and feet and eyes and ears. Just love him. He says, keep working. Keep working. Isaiah 5 and 20. Woe well, unto them that call it evil, good and good evil. Put darkness for light, light for darkness. All of these external things. Bitter for sweet, sweet for bitter. The struggle being the ability to maintain what's right and what's been promised while being surrounded by all these things. All these things. Galatians 6 and 9. 
Let us not be weary in well doing, for in due season we reap if we faint not. It is forever seasonal for the church. So don't get weary when you're doing the right thing, but it doesn't seem like the right thing is working. Because somewhere there's a Sean. Somewhere there's a brother that's addicted to alcohol, that's consumed and bound, but he's going to get into a pulpit somewhere on a Sunday morning, and he's going to talk to people that may or may not be bound like him, and he's going to share the revelatory power of God that everything in your life may not be perfect, but you serve an absolutely perfect God that loves you in every way, that you can come into the friend, be thankful when the word shows up in your church, it's an opportunity to change the world. be weary in well doing brother you get in the pulpit every time and you share the said the word of God don't be weary in that elder don't be weary telling them that you've got a promise that it hasn't come to fruition yet but God is faithful and not unrighteous to forget I probably told you some about uh, this man's story, if I have, just forgive me. But man, I feel it in the Holy Ghost here today. I want to pull up the text that he sent me. We were preaching just a few weeks ago in uh, Gun Barrel City. And uh, I sent him a text and said, hey man, I want you to share what it's like to be you. And he did. He shared some things. I said, what's it like to be you? He said, you got to be willing to get dirty and you got to be willing but to be disappointed often. He said perfection is never attained until the glory of God comes in. The best we'll ever have here is the pursuit of perfection. All I can do is keep moving. He has these light, lighthouse delivery centers where there's drug rehabs for men and for women. He said, how many baptized? It's 3,500 now. How many has received the Holy Ghost? He said, 1,800 now. He said, I've just now had a few that have graduated from the lighthouse delivery center. These things are happening. I said, brother, what's it like? He said, I get dirty every single day with addictions of every kind imaginable. But I keep on telling myself, don't get weary in well-doing because there's a time of reaping coming. Pastor, you watch under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Those doors are going to open up and these altars will be broken open and God is going to send you people that nobody wants, that their family that their spouses have written up, but God put a calling in them years ago. And because that calling never dies, He's going to send them to you. And they're going to say, How do I get across the bridge? And you're going to put them on the altar. And families are going to come through that door. And addictions are going to come through that door. And every chain will be broken. Welcome them. Show them the altar. And get dirty with them, Pastor. Get dirty with them. And God's going to break that thing open. Friend, hear me. That sin doesn't, my, my doctrine isn't for sale. My lifestyle isn't for sale. Addicts don't scare me. They don't look like me. They may not smell like me. They may not have, have habits like me, but they don't scare me. And the reason for that is the redeeming blood of Jesus Christ. Since there's a community that's got your fingerprint on it, and I want you to put your hand on that community. Lift your hands, Pastor, come here. Lift your hands right now. Sis, 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 come on. I want you to close your eyes. There's avenues and addresses and doorknobs that you're looking at right now. And God's about to open that up to you. Put your hands on me, Pastor. Come on. Come on. My fingerprints are about to get on a lost world right now. Hallelujah. I got shit right here. There's things that's trying to kill me. But I've got revival in my DNA. And I'm not going to let the world tell me no. Here it is time to put our fingerprint. On the world. 
was our church. Since in the morning you get up, you think of an address over a doorway, and you claim that in Jesus' name, and you put your fingerprint on the last of the day. Yesterday I went to a place of business. There was a man in there that saw me and walked up to me. He don't look nothing like us. He said, sir, I got to tell you what God gave me in prayer this morning. He said, God's about to send into your church people that are unchurched, that don't look nothing like you. And he said, he said, God's fixing to send in families that don't look nothing. He said, this is what God told me to tell you. He said, love them. Don't look nothing like me. Come up and tell me this. And then this man looks just like me. And he just confirmed what God. Brother, I don't know what in the world's going on in your life. 
but you let him order your steps. You don't question him left or right. You just pick it up and say, all right, God, I'm going to go through broken ships. I'm going to go through snake bites to get to revival. I may sail in on pieces of what my vision was, but I want revival. Church, which is his body. 
That's you and I. So the promises that were given to God, they were given to God for His sake. He's already sovereign. He's powerful because He's powerful. But the promises that came out of heaven through the Word of God were given for the church's sake. So you and I could have everything also put under our feet. He's the head over all things to the church, which is the body, the fullness of Him that filleth all in all. It's us. He fills us so we can fulfill promises to broken ships. Paul in the middle of the storm was exactly where he was supposed to be despite feelings. And for some of us here today, it doesn't feel like it's the will of God and yet heaven smiles because you figured out a way to persevere. The ship's broken in pieces. The wind is contrary, Acts 27 and 7. The wind decides to blow again after the storm has been kindled in Acts 27 and 14. And then the ship gets caught up in the middle of the contrary wind that decided to blow again in, the, in Acts 27 and 15. And in all of that, he was where he was supposed to be. Amen. In all of that. Kept him alive. Because the promises of God said, doesn't matter who wants to kill you, I've got a plan. Some came on boards in the text, 27 and 44. Some came on board, some on broken pieces of the ship. And it came to pass that they all escaped safe to, safe to land. He writes those pieces all the way to the shore. God had promised him in Acts 23 that you've got to bear witness of me in Rome. The only thing Paul had left in the storm was the promise. He had nothing else. He had the promise to go. See this? It's not impossible. The go is not impossible. The yes I will is the challenge. Hear me in the Holy Ghost. Raise your hands. Raise your hands. Just say yes I will. Let that be free. free. Come on. Yes I will God. I, it don't make sense to me. Come on sis. The, you, you can't make two and two four no matter how hard you try. And God's saying, yes, I will, and you'll take broken pieces to the shore because that's the power of the promise. Come on. Come on, somebody say, yes, I will with her right now in Jesus' name. Since the ship may look like it's busted, but the promises of God are yea and in him, amen. And they stand sure. Come on, it don't matter what's been said or hasn't been said. One door was open and it's now closed. It doesn't matter. Ship's legs is still Christ says, come on, come on, I'll do it, God, I'll do it, come on, you're not measured by anyone or anything, you're measured by the promise of God, the word of God in your life, yes, I will, yes, I will, because I believe it, just like the day you gave it to me. Some things are lost. The promise remains. The ship's broken. The promise remains. He rides the ship to the shore. And then there's the snake that latches on to him. Some things intentionally try to kill the promise in your life. The snake bites Paul on his hand, Pastor, right where he was working. Don't think that the enemy's not tactical whenever he comes against us. The first thing he comes against is our thinking. Because if we don't think it can happen, friend, the Holy Ghost can literally fall out of heaven and hit you on the top of the head. And it will not matter. You've got to believe that the God in you is greater than everything that's around you. No matter what's trying to kill you. The snake bites him on his head because he's killing the fire. It bites him where he is working. Pastor, be ready at all times. Because where you work is where you're going to find your greatest battle. But friend, it's not just cliche. And it's not just cannon fodder for a worship service. Greater is he that is in me than is he that is in the world. It is a declaration from now until the end of time. My God is more than enough. The ship's broken. The snake bites him where he's working. Paul said, if I had to sail in on broken pieces of the ship, no snake being on killing me is going to stop the promise of God inside of me. What I'm saying is there are some things that we would do well to just not pay any attention to them. Don't be surprised at the trying of your faith. 
saying as though some strange thing has come against you. He's going to hit you where you're working. Some things we just don't have to pay attention to. Paul shook it off. Why? Because 23, Acts 23, he said, you're going to go tell them about who I am and you're going to do that in Rome. You're going to do that at the Vatican. You're going to tell them where the highest of the high and the greatest of the great stay. So what I'm trying to tell the Jesus church is, is when some of this junk comes in here and tries to take out on purpose what God is trying to build, we may not need to pay attention to that. He shook it off. I'm going to pay attention to that. Is it part of my promise? Not if it's trying to kill you. That's the litmus test right there. Oh, look, it doesn't fit. Can't pay attention to that. Two witnesses this morning, Pastor. The man you met with me. People that don't look like you. People that need an open door. People that need love. Friend, how in God's name are they going to experience the love of God if we, representatives, ambassadors of Jesus Christ, don't love them first? I love you, but everything before but doesn't matter. I love you. I love you. Sometimes it's a show off. Some ships. Some snakes. Revive. Revive. 66,000 some change in the city of Victoria. 66,000 opportunities. One Jesus church. Shake off what don't work. Says, shake it off. Don't matter. Got to get rid of it. Boom. No matter the busted train. Stand with me this morning. Shake it. Get rid of the pieces. Start swimming. Go to the shore. See what God done. The apostle Paul. The winds are contrary. This front part of the ship gets stuck right. You understand the confusion of that statement. Part of the ship's working, part of it ain't. So when we get to that division where some are and some aren't, it breaks it. Oh, here in the Holy Ghost. That's why we all got to be going the same way. Or we're going to break this thing to pieces. What caused the ship to break wasn't a contrary wind. The ship's made to sail. You hoisted the mainsail up to the wind. And they committed to the sea. That's where they were supposed to be. What got the ship was some part was hanging on and the other part was letting go. And when there was division, well, you can't do nothing. You broke the ship into pieces. Paul had already, he said, Paul had already told them ahead of time what was coming and to be ready. The preparation had already been given. Ships and snakes. And revival. What happened when Paul got to that place? Understand. Understand that Melito wasn't his focus. Rome was. But oftentimes in scriptures, when the Lord was going to take care of a problem, he would be stopped to fix something on his way. He's headed to Jairus' house. The lady with the issue of blood reaches and touches the hem of his garment. He looks around. Says, you trust me. The disciple says, you see the throne, the throne of people. How can you say that? He goes, oh, no, virtue went out. He was going to take care of Jesus' yeah. daughter. And a plague stopped him. It's the truth. And he took enough time to take care of the people. Paul gets stuck on Melita. He gets stuck on an island full of barbarians. And the perception was they can never be changed. But sailing in on his broken ship, being bitten by snakes that were intent on killing him. He said, I'm a child, I'm child of the love of God. Then I'll have revival wherever I am. And until we can have revival in shipwrecks, we can't preach truth in Rome. Until we can preach revival with the ship broken down around us and the snakes coming after us. Friends, snakes are snakes because they're snakes. That's what they're bent on doing. We can't pay attention to that. And the Bible says they watched Paul. What's up with you? In their mind, if there was a storm like that, oh, they messed up. 
And then that didn't get him, so the snake did. He shook that off and said, well, there must be a God involved. So for three days, they're watching all of this happen. And who is? We're going to fix it with dysentery and high fever. I'm going to give you revival wherever you are. So all of those things happen. Paul's there. Bit where he's working, no matter the storm, continuing on, no matter the intentions. The Bible says they changed their mind because Paul did not lose the focus of his mission. The ship didn't change him. The snake didn't change him. It changed the people. How we respond to the calling of God has a direct impact on the revival we were called to ignite. Matthew 9, 36, when Jesus saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion because they fainted, they were scattered abroad like sheep with no shepherd. How we respond to the need. How we respond to the need. Paul lodges for three days. It was his father's healed. So then others were brought in and they were healed all across the island. They watched Paul for three days. They opened the door. Broken ships. Biting snakes. Revival. The early church portion of the book of Acts ends with three days. Three days as Paul's writing that letter. Three days marooned on an island turning into three months of revival. Eventually we turn into two years of preaching to the Gentiles that had no hope in Rome. My question is how far are we willing to go for revival? Three days, three months, two years. Three days being watched, three months preaching truth. Two years turning the world upside down for non-believers. Without anything, brother, just the Lord. What are we willing to do for revival in Victoria? Lift your hands with me. This morning, since you can play anything you want to, you're perfectly fine. Oh, who's got a busted ship this morning? You got a busted ship. Doesn't look like there's any hope. I want you to come around the front. We're going to just pray together. We're not singling you out. We're going to help you. Come on. If it feels like your hope and your plans and your dreams have been busted, come on. Come on. If it feels like some things have tried to kill you, then I want you to come on. Come on. Something trying to steal revival in your family. Something trying to take out revival in your life. Come on. There's some ships that are broken. Some snakes that have attacked us. But for there's revival in this house here today. Who's willing to step up and say, All right, God, my voice is great enough. I'm going to watch this happen. Come on. Come on. Come on. You got family just outside the door. You got family right there in your community. People that you love. in the house today. You've never had the Holy Ghost. Pastors already talked about it. You've never had it and you want it. It's simply the Spirit of